The AHA Leadership Dialogue Series focuses on trending topics with healthcare, business, and community leaders from around the country. AHA Board Chair Wright L. Lassiter III is joined by Debbie Hatmaker, Chief Nursing Officer of the American Nurses Association Enterprise. Hatmaker shares insights about what to do systemically to ensure a hospital environment where nurses feel safe and are supported and valued for their work. Lassiter and Hatmaker also discuss workplace violence, the current nursing shortage, and retention strategies. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining uh, me today for another leadership dialogue session. Uh, I'm Wright Lassiter. I'm president and CEO of Henry Ford Health System and honored to be the board chair of the American Hospital Association this year. I am very much looking forward to our conversation today as we talk about one of the most important issues in healthcare today, and that is the sustainability and the safety of our healthcare workforce. Um, our guest today joins us from the American Nurses Association and will be sharing an important perspective, and that is the voice of the nurse. As the most trusted profession in America, we know that nurses serve as a critical backbone within our healthcare organizations. Uh, at Henry Ford, like many other organizations across the country, uh, we are deeply committed to supporting our team members, and we're making investments necessary to not only retain our talent, but continually add new talent in what has become an extremely competitive marketplace. Nationwide, uh, in fact, worldwide, uh, we are seeing healthcare worker turnover greater than at any time we've seen in our lifetimes. And uh, not only in nursing, uh, but I know in Michigan hospitals, in addition to having to grapple with the challenges related to fewer nurses, uh, we've had to fill critical shortages in other positions like uh, laboratory technicians, medical assistants, housekeepers, pharmacists, and more. I believe some of this is due to pandemic-related burnout, uh, leading to some of our team members to opt for early retirement. Uh, in some cases, we have folks who, who love what they do in healthcare, uh, just reaching a point where they simply say, I just can't go through this uh, any longer. So everyone is feeling the pinch. Uh, everyone is feeling the pressure of the great resignation uh, as it's being called. Uh, but in healthcare, such shortages can mean vital services are canceled. It can mean necessary care is not provided. And frankly, it can be the difference at times between uh, life and death, uh, which is why we must focus on advocating for the types of changes necessary to support our caregivers. Uh, so let's jump into today's leadership dialogue and let me introduce Dr. Debbie Hatmaker. Uh, Debbie is the Chief Nursing Officer of the American Nurse Association Enterprise, and that includes uh, the ANA that represents the nation's 4 million nurses, as well as the American Nurse Credentialing Center and the American Nurse Foundation. Dr. Hatmaker's diverse uh, practice experience serves her well uh, as an advocate on behalf of patients, nurses, and the profession overall. Uh, after an early career in public health and maternal child health, she was on the faculty at the Medical College of Georgia School of Nursing for 16 years, and she has served in many elected and appointed leadership positions, including serving as the president of the Georgia Nurses Association. So Dr. Hatmaker, thank you again for joining me today to discuss the current workforce challenges nursing shortages and, and to discuss uh, solutions to ensure that we can build a stronger workforce in the future. So Debbie, glad to have you with us today. Great. Well, I'm glad to be here. Um, it, it is a very both exciting and trying time in healthcare and for nurses in particular, as we're hopefully coming out of this pandemic, um, but um, a lot of hard work uh, going on. Yes. Well, we appreciate all the efforts of the American Nurse Association and you as as the chief nurse for that organization. And we'll just uh, spend a few minutes talking about uh, some of your perspectives and, and some of your thoughts about how we can navigate the challenges and, and come out on the other end. Um, so, you know, we saw certainly in nursing uh, and other workforce shortages, uh, even before the pandemic, these challenges have just grown uh, even more acute uh, during the last two years. Uh, we still have an aging population uh, with increased patient complexity 
and need as well as an aging workforce. Uh, but the incredible toll that, um, that hospital workers have endured during the pandemic uh, has undoubtedly led to, to burnout and to the challenges that, we, that we're currently facing. From your perspective, how can we best support caregivers and confront nurse burnout? That's a very important question right now. And, and nurses, even pre-pandemic, were experiencing, as you said, challenges with burnout in the environment, stresses in the work they do. It is hard work, doing, especially those in direct care uh, in constant uh, contact with patients and their families and the challenges in the environment. So um, nursing and formalized nursing has been studying burnout for decades, but it has been most acute uh, and the magnifying glass certainly happened during this pandemic. And I think rather than focusing on the individual nurse, as we've sometimes heard with um, nurses focusing on accessing mental health services or looking at stress techniques or what they can do as individuals, all that's important. And I don't want to dismiss that, but we have to go back to our clinical settings and ask, what do we need to do systemically to really get at the root of what's causing this burnout? And I would say, of, of course, when nurses or units or you know, some hospitals are understaffed or constrained in their staffing or constrained in their resources, that just fuels the fire to burn out. So it's important as nurse leaders and leaders in hospitals and, and various employers really look at what is the appropriate level of safe staffing, not only safety on behalf of the patients and issues of quality, but safe for the nurses and the caregivers as well to try and make sure they're providing quality care and we're not burning out these so important resources in order to deliver that care. So looking at issues of if, if hospitals, and I know there was some of this during the pandemic and that was necessary during times of crisis, but using measures like mandatory overtime or not being able to adequately provide for breaks or pay time off. Uh, all of that is really important. And nurses have to feel like they're valued and that their employers really believe and trust in their value and feel supported. And they're not always feeling that way based on what we're hearing and the surveys that we're receiving. Well, so I, I really appreciate um, those perspectives. And I think, um, you know, as you're as the counsel you're providing to us, which is really to focus on 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 those systemic things that that demonstrate value and demonstrate respect uh, for for our critical workforce. So I appreciate that point of view. Maybe let's let's uh, turn our attention a little bit to um, retention and, and attraction. Uh, you know, as a field, we, we certainly have to come up with uh, creative ways to retain and recruit uh, highly dedicated and, and the skilled workforce necessary to care for the patients that are that are entrusted to us. You know, we certainly hear about organizations doing things like um, paying back student loans, um, providing child care for team members, providing transportation, uh, offering tuition reimbursement and other sort of training benefits. Uh, but from your point of view, uh, what are some of the successful retention strategies that you're seeing and hearing about across the industry and across the field uh, from, from, from your members that that's, uh, are proving successful? Right. Well, the, the ones you cite certainly are, are incentives and retention strategies that employers have used. I would say a number of nurses value those strategies. But importantly, I think, is to make sure they have uh, those, those abilities, those opportunities for professional development, and, and especially as we hear from nurses, respect and value in the wages or in their salary that they receive. Um, Certainly, um, salary and escalating salaries have received a lot of attention as, as hospitals have attempted to recruit nurses and move nurses from different employment settings. Um, but I, I think that is important. And nurses have told us in, in the surveys we've done that, that recognition, uh, compensation, adequate compensation for the work is important. But, but secondly, those things won't stick if we're not providing great work environments. So if we're not providing safe work environments 
and nurses aren't having to worry about workplace violence incidents from patients or families or, or even um, other employees. Those are all important. And then I think having the ability to have a strong say in their work, to contribute to shared decision making, or sometimes it's referred to as shared governance, is important because they're the ones that are at the patient's side delivering care, making clinical decisions. And it's important that we make sure they have a voice when decisions perhaps are being made at, at an executive level or a management level, and they feel like they have an investment in, in those decisions that are coming down for them to then move forward on. I appreciate that. Um, you know, so as I just reflect um, professional development, um, certainly respectful salary, uh, a great work environment, and then and then the focus on a voice and having a voice to contribute to the work environment. Um, I think four really important points that um, that's good counsel for 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 our field. You highlighted one issue that, that maybe it'd be useful for us to turn to, and that's one that that some in the field don't like talking about uh, because we all wish that it didn't exist, and that's uh, workplace violence. I know clearly. Um, you know, every person who sits in my chair that I talk with regularly as a CEO of, of a large organization uh, would love to know that the answer to this uh, phenomenon is zero, that it never happens. Uh, but we certainly know that workplace violence is an increasing concern uh, within our healthcare community. Um, and we certainly, as you indicated, would, would all agree that uh, nurses and, and frankly, all healthcare workers deserve to be able to, to do their craft, uh, whatever that craft may be, without the, the sense of feeling unsafe um, and, and feeling um, uh, fully respected. The AHA, I think, as you know, is committed to identifying tools and best practices that can help uh, both prevent and mitigate workplace violence, and also to advocate with our policy and lawmakers uh, in Washington to ensure that the safety of healthcare workers and patients is supported at the highest level and is a, and is a preeminent priority. So let's talk about um, what steps uh, would the ANA like to see uh, be taken to ensure that um, work, workplace violence is, is frankly eliminated and that uh, worker safety, uh, and particularly of our, our nursing corps, uh, is of primary uh, importance? Well, um, ANA has been working on the issue of workplace violence for a number of years. And in particular, uh, even pre-pandemic, we were very much focused on a zero tolerance campaign for workplace environment and encouraging nurses and in dialogue with their employers to really look at what are the strategies that were meaningful to move in that direction and to make sure they felt supported by their employers when incidents did happen, uh, that action was taken. And, and not, not all nurses, we, we certainly heard of examples where that didn't always play out. Um, and so that that was of a concern. I do know that in some states they've moved on legislation to help mitigate workplace violence. That certainly, as we measure and look to see how successful some of those legislative efforts are, we're always open uh, in collaborating uh, in, in moving some meaningful legislation if, if that's um, applicable and, and how we can work together on that. I, I think looking at um, Kind of reinstating emergency temporary standards as we move to permanent standards to really try to protect hospital uh, and work and um, healthcare employees from COVID-19 and other other infectious diseases uh, just really does send the message to nurses and and to other healthcare providers that they're supported uh, and there is an expectation that you should feel safe at work and all measures will be put in place to make sure you feel that safety. Really appreciate that. I would just tell you that we none of us can put enough attention toward this issue uh, until we're sure that, um, that, that there is a zero tolerance and that there is zero incidence of workplace violence uh, happening in our, in our industry. So thank you very much. Let's maybe turn to, um, uh, to the nursing shortage. I mean, we, we certainly know that that the nursing shortage is a multifactorial issue. It's not. Uh, it's not an issue that can get solved in the short term uh, with piecemeal approach. Uh, we know that uh, again, people uh, sitting in my chair are talking with their boards about this is not a short term issue. This is not a one year fix. This is a multi year issue to to uh, address the challenge. 
Um, so what, what's in your mind are some sustainable solutions to building a nursing pipeline uh, to help us uh, deal with, with the fact that we need to produce uh, more nurses as we have more that are, that are retiring or, or leaving, leaving the field? Well, the, the, the issue on the supply side certainly is something that, that, you know, comes and goes over the decades as we've looked at various shortages, um, primarily, uh, especially as the pandemic eases, the shortage is still felt regionally in particular or in particular states or areas of states more so than a comprehensive one across the nation. So certainly regional strategies will have to be put in place as well. Having taught for 16 years as a faculty member, um, enticing nurses to move back into graduate education and to move into nursing education as a career change is quite the enticement when in particular it may mean a salary decrease uh, as, it, as it did for, uh, for me at the time. And also, um, you know, even colleges and universities sometimes pay extra in certain disciplines, but never did they quite do that uh, for nursing faculty. So certainly the incentives need to be there to encourage nurses to go into education and to support the ability to um, have the, the education that's necessary, even at the clinical site. And I know there are a number of academic and hospital partnerships to try and drive that clinical education on site, and those certainly need to continue to be replicated. I do think as we think about strategies for supply, and there are a number of them that continue to be in place, including the Federal FAN Act that certainly ANA supports, and we'd like to see move forward to give some additional funding to support um, schools of nursing and increase the supply of nurses. But on balance, I think it's important that um, the public or legislators in particular don't have a skewed view of how to increase the nursing numbers. We can't put all of our eggs in the nursing education basket. Um, I think we can't, as I heard someone say recently, we're, we're not going to be able to just fund supply and solve the shortage because we can't have them coming in the front door if we aren't also at the same time improving our work environment, talking about the value of nurses, making sure they're fully engaged and committed to remaining in their career and just simply have them exit out the back door after a few years. And as we've seen recently in, in, some, in some surveys that we've done, some of our youngest nurses, those um, under 35 in particular, seem to be the most concerned about the work environment. They, they're most dismayed. They've indicated higher levels of feeling less healthy and less optimistic about the future. And we should all be very concerned about that because those are the ones we're counting on to be here while many of us move toward our retirement age to exit the profession. And if those are the ones that we have the most concerns about retaining and making sure we've gotten them out of nursing school, we've gotten them in their first jobs, then we have to work really hard at retaining them, making sure that they feel uh, supported and they feel valued in the work environment for sure. And, and you know, I think it just points to a critical component around support for the transition into practice as graduates move into those first jobs, move into the work environment, and also that support for onboarding, which is really hard right now as hospital systems in particular, as they've been challenged by COVID, are feeling probably less focused in that area, but making sure that we, we value them and want them to stay. Well, I, I appreciate your commentary. And, it's, and the last point you made about onboarding, we just say that, that our organization has, has just taken a renewed approach to, to the onboarding process. And we just launched a, a new re-energized and, and pretty uh, comprehensive uh, new onboarding uh, program for our, our nurses as of yesterday uh, or as of Monday of this week. And so, and so we've certainly taken that piece of advice to heart. Um, I know our time is getting uh, short, but let me just uh, close with 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 one quick uh, quick.
question about policy changes. Um, you mentioned the FAN Act and you talked a bit about some of the things that we can do from a policy perspective. You know, clearly the AHA supports uh, nursing workforce development programs to bolster uh, nursing education at all levels to strengthen uh, nursing education and to fund uh, institutions that are educating nurses uh, to practice in, in our field. And, uh, and just sort of curious, um, are there, um, um, and also to focus on incentive, incentives that helps uh, support nurses um, practicing in areas that maybe are, are, um, are difficult to, to staff like rural and, and medically underserved communities. Um, are there any other uh, policy or regulatory support that, uh, that the ANA would like to see enacted that, that might help accelerate uh, both placement of nurses and the acceleration of, of educational efforts to, uh, to bolster the field? You certainly named some that, that we're interested in as well and supportive of. And, and in addition to the, my earlier reference to workplace violence, certainly um, that mandatory overtime uh, efforts to really try and, and make sure that we set up, a, 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 again, back to a positive work environment that, that will support and retain nurses in these settings. I think, you know, one of the things we're really turning our attention to, and it's a it's a hard nut to crack, is really looking at some of the payment models, current structures that are set up in the regulatory system about how nursing that's always been included in room and board. You know, we've not been able to tease out what is the value of nursing, how should employers uh, and nurses be appropriately compensated. We're really trying to tease out what are what are the opportunities there, and to collaborate with other um, with healthcare systems as well as as others who are interested in really getting at this, because you know some of the constraints as I go back to uh, how um, nursing has been viewed as a cost to the system, as opposed to really nursing being the reason patients are in the hospital is to often receive nursing care. Uh, it, it's not, it's certainly not been helpful just to have it all included in, in the current compensation system. So that that is something that we're really trying to give some attention to. Can think about the policy on that end, think about the opportunities for improvement there, and really think about, um, you know, what is the appropriate staffing levels that employers and nurses should be compensated for to, again, provide high quality care, the best care for patients? So Dr. Debbie Hatmaker, it's been a pleasure to spend time with you today and for you to join me on our leadership dialogue. There's so much more that we could discuss related to uh, bolstering uh, nursing practice, uh, supporting nursing retention and recruitment and, and education. Um, but I so much appreciate you sharing your insights uh, on how we can best support our nurses. I certainly want to thank uh, the American Nurses Association for its continued partnership, as I know that AHA works very closely with the ANA and also the American Medical Association uh, to have a unified voice uh, during the pandemic. And so we're very much appreciative of the partnership and of the work that, that you're doing. Until next time, everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. I hope you'll be back for uh, next month's uh, leadership dialogue. Thanks very much and have a good day.